Welcome again to our conversations with our elders and our icons. Today we have with us um, Mr. Ngang Thomas, um, a veteran journalist, an entrepreneur, and a Gambian. Your hosts are Professor Abdullah Sen and myself, Baba Silla. We are, as we have done in the past, started by exploring with Mr. Thomas his life and his experiences. But we have with, with us today a man with a lot of experience and um, somebody who's written and traveled far and wide. So he will be doing most of the talking. Mr. Thomas, you are a Gambian born in Banjo. What year was this? 1942, 12th of October. You were born in 1942, 12th of April? October. 12th of October. So this is your 78th birthday. As I understand it, you look like you're not even 70. Okay. Um, you were born in Banjul. Did you grow up in Banjul? Oh, I was born and bred in Banjul, I would say. I went to Albion School, my kindergarten school. And from Albion, we went to St. Mary's School, where I graduated to the Methodist Boys High School. We spent six years at the Methodist Boys School, Methodist Boys High School. And after the fifth form, I went to take up a job as a first laboratory assistant at the School of Science. Then the sixth form, uh, was the, uh, the, four, the first six form, six form class started in 1959 when Gambia High School was opened. It was a co education school which started at the Methodist, Boys, uh, Methodist Mission at Dobson Street, which later transferred to the new building near opposite the Banyul Cemetery. I took up the job as laboratory assistant with the view to graduate in my ordinary levels to do a science career. However, science was not my calling, and I decided to quit after two years. Thereafter, I decided to go into arts. I had six O levels, and uh, uh, tried to obtain entrance to Fordham College. At the time, Fordham College accepted O levels, but then I had to go to Crab Island School to teach for one year to study for my early levels to make up for the full course. After, four, after one year at the Crab Island School, I went to Yundum College where I thought would be a, would have the conducive atmosphere to pursue my academic career. However, the conditions that we are prevailing at the college uh, did not suit even ordinary school boys, let alone students who were later to become teachers. I decided to organize the students and we finally end up up with a strike to fulfill the points that we desired that the school had to live up to the standard of a real college, which it was supposed to be. Nevertheless, after 31 years of frustration, 31 days of frustration, the strike failed and I had to go back and reconsider my career. There and then, of course, I was classified as a radical who had communistic linings, and therefore there was a warrant of arrest issued, which I had to escape or go to jail. There and then I decided that I had to leave to go back to Sierra Leone, my original roots, where my father came from. With the view that from Sierra Leone I'll be able to pursue my career from any scholarship in Ghana, at the time then Nkrumah could accommodate radicals like myself. After a few months in Sierra Leone, I decided to continue to Ghana because staying there for, for at least an academic year would have meant losing one year and at the same time without the means of gaining entrance at uh, Forever College, I decided to go to Ghana. When I arrived in Ghana at the time, Nkrumah was calling all the progressive African states to come over and be united. There I found the Mr. Kofi Baja, who was then the Secretary General of the Pan-African Union of Journalists, 
whom I met in Gambia during a debate. I introduced myself to him and told him of my plans to travel abroad to further my education. He asked me what I wanted to pursue. I told him that I wanted to pursue a career in journalism. He said there was no school in journalism in Ghana at the time, so I had to seek for acceptance in one of the schools, either in Moscow, East Germany, then German Democratic Republic, or in Hungary, Budapest. I was fortunate enough to be accepted to the School of Journalism in Budapest, where I stayed for two years, and thereafter in 1964, 65 and 66. At 66, I decided that I would travel to other countries to improve my standard, because at the time, uh, I didn't consider myself matured enough and experienced to carry out the functions of a progressive journalist at the time. So I decided to do six more months of practical in Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Soviet Union and the German Democratic Republic. After the third year, I left and came back to the Gambia. On my return, I applied for the post of an assistant information officer. But then the salaries were so discouraging that I decided to follow my studies and then on my return perhaps I will be able to establish my own paper, which I did. I went to Birmingham and I, I created the first Gambia Journalist Association. I was the Secretary General then and we had a conference in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, but what year was this? This was in 1967. Okay. So I traveled to Czechoslovakia in 1967 and in Prague the International Organization of Journalists was organizing a world conference of journalists. There I took part and thereafter I traveled to England where I decided to stay to pursue my course of uh, journalism. For six years I worked in different papers, attended several courses and at the end of the day I was able to, uh, I was able to uh, achieve the degree of efficiency which I considered to be sufficient enough to able, enable me to establish a paper on my return home. I stayed in England for about seven years and in 1972 I returned back to the Gambia. After two years of freelance journalism, to acquaint myself with the political atmosphere in the Gambia and all the, all the areas of interest which I pursued, I decided to launch my own paper called The Gambian in 1974. Yeah, but what was the political climate like at the time? The political climate was hostile. It was just at the time when the colonialists uh, gave the toughest time to journalists because at the time there were no progressive journalists who could confront, confront the colonial powers. I was one of the leaders of the progressive elements who were uh, classified as communist agents. But, but fortunately enough, after establishing my paper, I was able to prove, to prove myself as a professional journalist rather than the recalcitrant I was considered to be. However, I continued my paper for 20 years. And at the advent of Yahya Jammes coming to power, I decided that I quit because I knew for a fact that uh, any journalist who dared to face a soldier, a young soldier, with power, drunken with power and, uh, and uh, a dictator for that matter, would be risking his life. I decided to close my paper. At the end of, the, at the end of 1970 to 1994, I decided to go back into freelance. I traveled to Senegal, where I worked for two years, and then to Lome, where I worked for six months, and then to Ivory Coast, where I worked for six months, and then to Nigeria, where I worked for about a year, and then to United States of America. Okay, during, the, during your stint in all these West African countries, you were working with already established Well, as a freelance, I, as a freelance, my papers were, my articles were written in English and translated. Because of the agreement we had to make to save me from uh, uh, go going into conflict with the authorities, I was not allowed to sign my articles, but I, they paid me the money that I needed. So I wrote in the name of others, but at the same time I got well paid the amount that was due to me. So in Lome, Senegal and, uh, and Ivory Coast, I wrote in English, but I had colleagues who were sympathetic to my cause, who agreed to get my articles translated, and I was paid the fee that uh, I, mean, I was qualified for. But your views about the world still persisted. You were still well. I was still a radical who considered more uh, a pan-Africanist because at the time anybody who was 
really determined to 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 to, to practice the freedom of expression uh, would be considered anti-government, anti-security, security risk, and all these other levels. I, I was lucky that in more of more often than not, I was able to escape their plots because in some cases they had the intelligence uh, service to cover me. Some were able to compromise with me, some were hostile, and I, in the end, had to decide that I either resign or continue to stay in England. But then I chose the latter. I had to come back home. Okay. But or when not, you came back home, um, you also veered into other areas, such as entrepreneurship. Well, I went into publishing, because the first Almanac I published, which was of Jawara and the promotion of the Gambia and the Libya uh, Association, uh, Lankatra Union, was the photograph of the Jawara and Gaddafi on a, on, a, uh, I mean, on, a, on a calendar, which gave me the capital I needed to go into other areas of publication, like brochures, publications of um, magazines. I wrote also in Liberia together with a Senegalese journalist, Abdullah Sow. The paper was called Giriot de Cayor. I wrote the first magazine promoting Liberia. Unfortunately, we are so successful that I was requested by the Ministry of Information of Liberia to, co to stay in the country for all two years. So I wrote four editions, which earned me a lot of money to come back home after two years. But you also were one of the pioneers of Billboard. Billboard. Well, that comes into, you are right. What happened was that I was going to Ghana to print this almanac I told you about, Jawar and, uh, and Gaddafi. On my way from the airport, I saw billboards, which never existed in the Gambia. So I said, wow, here is an opportunity that I can capture, take it to Gambia, sell the idea, and see if it would be lucrative enough to, for me to continue. I came back, there was nobody billboard. The Nigerian Air, uh, Air, Airways company, decided to, to sponsor me. I knew for a fact that they could use me, so I decided to go on my own independently. Either they buy as customers or leave me alone to pursue my, my marketing exercises. And that I succeeded in doing. So I was able to get the Gambia, <coughs> this uh, Nigeria Airways, Jewel Brew, and uh, Jewel Brew, and uh, many other, few other customers. And uh, from then on, the billboard idea began to <laughs> gain momentum. And then uh, look at this boy, this job, uh, something job was in America. Madhum Job. Madhum Job came into the picture. He was more uh, uh, technically minded on the construction line because his father was a builder. So he was able to build several billboards along the road. I gave up the idea and went into publishing again. Okay. But your paper, The Gambian, kept its name all the way through. Well, yes, we did because um, they wanted me to sell the paper, the name of the paper to the guys. But I told them that at the time, uh, it was not a question of selling the paper, but whether they would be able to carry on my editorial policy. Because my, paper were, my publications were guided by the editorial policy which I adopted. That, was, that I was there to promote freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of association. And I was not ready to compromise on anything except the acceptance of what I wanted to say. Now, who were your contemporaries in journalism at the time? M.B. Jones, R.S.A. Allen, Pink Sock, Bartanawale, and those were the only... Dixon Curry, that's yes, right, yes. Dixon Curry. We are the members of the First Gambia Journalist Association. On my failure to return from England, they continued, and thereafter it died. And I came to know when I was with the Gambian Press Union that uh, their First Gambia Press Union was established in, I don't know which year. They forgot the history of the, of the former association. And, but it never existed long enough to be recognized as such. So the white contemporaries were Dixon Coley, Persock, R.S.A. Allen, and um, 
uh, Batrawale. But you were never for once tempted to resort to the type of checkbook journalism that existed in many well, countries. I, I believe in the freedom of expression, and for that matter, uh, my portions of my aims to promote pan Africanism did not tolerate or entertain any idea of compromising the integrity of journalism. I pursued it fearlessly and with the determination to go to jail or die for it. But I maintain my principles because I learned from Kwame Nkrumah that any concession on matters of principles infers the abandonment of principles. Principles are either uh, indivisible, they must either be maintained or sacrificed. And I was not ready to sacrifice the principles of journalism. Therefore, I went throughout my career and deemed after my career to the very day that here I am sitting down, I will never compromise the integrity of journalism. Okay. Earlier on, you talked about the coming of Yai Jame and Jame's rule. In 1994. That was in 1994. Um, and Jame came and um, overthrew the regime that was here. Now, where did you find yourself? Um, did you, at the time, believe that perhaps changes were inevitable? Well, changes were inevitable, well since we all look forward to a change, when Jami came, we thought that here was the opportunity to be able to propagate some of the ideas that we had, that was the freedom of expression and the like. But my experience with governments like Kwame Nkrumah, Idi Amin, uh, 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 Secretary, I thought that the Gambia could also resort to the same end. And therefore, I became very cautious with Jame, giving him time to see whether he was going to pursue meaningfully the aims and objectives that we look forward to. But time proved that he was not the guy. Yeah, but the initial rhetoric The initial was rhetoric very much... was very much welcome and uh, considered to be something that we could pursue. But uh, knowing the guy, after having assisted him to, or advised him to form the Yame Foundation, which I, which I, I founded, together with Dr. Sajatal, I, I considered receiving and giving away money as something that was not a, 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 a prudent exercise. Yeah. Rather, we should institutionalize an organization through which money could be funded, we used to fund and received and put into a proper good purpose. He agreed. So we founded the Jame Foundation. Uh, after Dr. Tal acquainting him with the idea that I had the idea to create a foundation which would pursue these aims, he agreed that he will finance it. So I told him that it will be very proper to call it Jame Foundation. And he swallowed my <laughs> idea of it and line. He advised Baba Tule to work with me, and Baba gave me $150,000 in the beginning. And I decided that I would keep the money to work out means of creating funds that we could use as a takeoff. In that area, I organized a, 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 a reception at the Senegambi Hotel. Prior to that, I had the idea in Garen that you could sell tables for gold table, silver table, and bronze table at a price which will generate an income to finance our activities. Okay, but up till then, you had the idea that Jame was a progressive leader and Jame... No, can... intermittently I found him to, to be very unpredictable, distrustful, hostile and anti-intellectual. So I became very cautious of what I was going through and uh, I began to take the greatest care, one, in meeting him, the deliberations, what I had to say and what I had not to say, and then the activities that I carried out, whether they were in conformity with my original beliefs or not. Uh, and uh, by so doing, I found him to be an incompatible character with me or my aspirations. What I couldn't expose myself as such. So therefore, I cautiously maneuvered until when we handed over the, the, we ended the 
the, 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 the lodging committee and I handed over all the 1.2 million dollars that I collected in a month to ISA to JICD. At the end of it, we had a meeting at the State House where I was greatly thanked and pleased by Yame. But then his last words made me become very skeptical of him that when God intends to send a letter, he'll send it to somebody with grey hair. And then I was very grey haired. So I became very skeptical <laughs> that here was a man looking for a head to cut <laughs> with a grey hair. From then, that day on, we took a photograph at the, at the State House steps, and that was the last time I ever met Jamie. Okay, let me take you back to the founding of the Observer newspaper. Oh yeah, I worked in the Observer. Yeah. I understand that um, Jamie was advised by Dr. Tao or whoever to establish a paper because it would have been your mouthpiece to sell. Yes, but before the Observer, the idea was to create a paper called The Patriot which I edited, four editions. What I did was I serialized the manifesto of the party, plus my editorials, to promote the idea of, uh, of, 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 of uh, the idea of, of promoting uh, the freedom of expression. But then the senior members of the party had a meeting with me during when I was told that Gabe was not interested in newspapers, mm. and that it was more of a benefit to forget the idea rather than pushing it at to, towards an end which will become catastrophic. So we decided to forego for, for the, whole, the whole thing. Then came the observer. Jaime spoke to Saja and Saja promised him that I would talk to Ngani, who I consider to be more competent than most of his contemporaries here. So he will take over the editorship. But then when Saja told me, I told him that on condition that we will not compromise the editorial policy which I had already established, and that was the freedom of expression without interference. They agreed. After six months of practice, it was on African Day or so, I wrote an editorial, full page. I really credited him with the performance of his government in the first three months. What then we had uh, uh, what is it called? We had a specific law which allowed them to arrest and detain a journalist and the, his detention be renewable. I forgot the, the exact wording. The exact, not the exact article. Mm. Decree. 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 Mm. Decree. 57, 57, 57, 57, 57, 57, mm. Decree 57. Mm. 71. 71. So I quoted that and said that it was undemocratic counterproductive and reactionary. And therefore, Jamal can only be seen as someone who will either fight for what he had already earlier promised or be accused of compromising the integrity of the press. Mm -hmm. He so called Baba Job and told him that I told you that Uncle Gang is a very dangerous man. You see, I was not here at the time, but I understand he growled at um, best. And that was what hounded Best out of this country. Well, Best, Best was also a very dynamic character. At the time, the editorials he wrote, I considered them, as I told him, uh, not only provoking, but uh, an invitation to open war with Jami. Because he was writing progressively. And he maintained the standards properly. He was a well-educated journalist. But thereafter, I decided that um, I should keep away from Best. Because then I had already been informed that he was on the NIA list and they, have, they were preparing to attack him. But then Jame had the idea to buy the whole paper, transform it into something of his own like, liking. But to do that, they had to get rid of Best. And that's how they captured him. Ex expelled him after a few days of torture on the beach, Bullfoot Beach. He was tortured. Seriously, he went with a severe acute pneumonia. I spoke to him, and the last day he said, I admire you for your guts to stay in this country, Mr. Thomas, and I pray that you will not end up as I am. Because we are of different coming. You come from Liberia, I'm a Gambian. <laughs> my, my, my own approach is different from yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Thomas, for having us and for uh, giving us the opportunity to spend some time with you to 
Basically, look at your career and your life. I know over the course of your career, you've had a lot of awards. One of them was given to you by the United Nations Democracy Fund. Uh, and the plaque is right here. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? After the, after all said and done during the 50 years of my career, uh, I came to the conclusion that I had to write an article giving, analyzing the situation which led to the uh, fall of Jami, how we left this country in disgrace and dishonor. So I wrote an article, Yaya Jame lives in disgrace and dishonor. The article was so well received by every Tom Dicker had in this country, and my fellow journalists considered me to be someone who deserves recognition. At the time, I think they had in mind the press union of presenting awards to, to, to um, elderly journalists like Bartra Wale, myself, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, OJ, OJ's brother. OJ, he's your elder brother. Mm -hmm. What's his name? OJ Minister, he's mm -hmm. elder brother. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, the three of us, we are recipients of this award, which was sponsored by the United Nations Democratic Forum, and through the press union, we were awarded this, this, this awards. I think um, I deserve it, first of all, because we are the pioneers of journalism in this country. When I started, there were very few journalists. They were not actually trained journalists as such. I was the first journalist who went really through academic training to come back and uh, launch my own paper for that matter, which I wrote for 20 years. So again, I wrote not only to make money, but I wrote to enlighten governments to fight for certain principles which I considered honorable and which the public appreciated. And uh, through their support, this paper was able to survive on its own without being corrupted by the then uh, 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 corrupt elements who were out to silence anybody who opposed their, 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 their dishonorable uh, aims and objectives. Uh, to this end, my contribution stood out more openly when I went into investigative journalism, when I engaged in investigative journalism to expose the corrupt practices of the Customs Department from 1984 to 1989. There was a sum of $850 million embezzled by the Customs officers and those who were engaged in their delivery services. This was the abuse of the transit trade which uh, allowed importers to receive goods and pay their duties after. But then they decided to, to assign the delivery of goods to foreign countries, and that means that in transit, they would not pay to the Gambia government a single bottle, but to the government where the, the, the goods were loaded, and this was this were all false declarations. Through my investigations and uh, the opportunity that enabled me to gain uh, uh, documentary evidences, which I used to prove these cases, I was able to get the top brass of the customs department, seven of them, dismissed, and indeed, Jawara called for their uh, uh, detention, no, called for their, what do you call it, trial in, in court, but then after public sympathy and you know the Gambians approaches to, 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 to silence me, uh, they were dismissed. But the investigation I did during those five months really earned me a repetition which to this day is what I'm enjoying that I was able to go through that exercise without being corrupted. And they had already made approaches to corrupt me with about $4 million at the time. Who of the, of the Gambia would have refused $4 million at the at, time? At the time, very few, if any. I did reject it. They are all hearing me, they know that what I'm saying is actual, factual, is true. I rejected it. But fortunately enough, I was able to earn more than I expected, in fact, because there was a Lebanese who was called Ghazi Mahmoud, who became uh, the arch enemy of the custom officers because they had denied him the facilities they gave to the other importers. So exp he helped in exposing their malpractices and the false documents I was able to obtain came through him, from him. So we assigned Private Eye in London to investigate and get us the manifestos 
of the 67 ships that came during this period and we did not pay the custom duties. I was able to obtain those information, the, 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 the manifest and the signature of the importers, which really astounded the, the Gambian public. How did Ngani succeed in getting such documentary evidence? The president called them that, told them that I told you that Ngani does not tell lies. Funnily enough, he said, I could defend. Mm. So <laughs> I was credited to the, to the point that he gave me a contract of 10,000 dollars a month for six months. The civil servant at the time, Pajalo of NIA, rejected the idea and said, no, Sadaw, this is too much. He said, no, you are civil servants. Mm -hmm. Then you will not enjoy a pension, you will not enjoy it, mm -hmm. uh, the price. all the benefits you enjoy. Allow him to write the first edition. If we agree, fair enough, we continue. If we disagree, we will forget him. But I know that he's competent, he's professionally competent to do it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the first edition. It was in a Gambia, it's a myth, NYTH. Mm. I destroyed the configuration. First of all, and I continued, he paid, he paid me the first 10,000 at the NI. But then came as he said, the director of NI decided that I would not be paid in the office, he'll bring the money at home so that he could get his own share of it. So I gave him a thousand dollars to offer 10,000 I for five months. Only five months. <laughs> this was the man who was supposed to arrest me. I know. That's... <laughs> so you see, the degree of poverty had so much eroded self respect and dignity of Gambians. To the point that they become so gullible, mm. so subservient, mm -hmm. that uh, I felt I was very proud of myself, to mm -hmm. be quite frank. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I feel very, very happy and proud that I'm able to work in the streets of Baju. Absolutely. I mean, you've, had a very, you've had a very, very good reputation yeah, of being somebody yeah, outside yeah, of the mainstream. I'm telling you. Always speaking yeah, truth to the power. Uh, I had no money. Ask Baba. Ibu Jahar always used to phone us. I had no money, mm -hmm. but I lived honorably because I'm not an easily approachable character. I, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I can take my point, stand my, you know, at any time. And fortunately enough, it paid me well. So journalism in the Gambia, I could say to a great extent, was really, was really fought for to maintain the principles of our, of our, of our forefathers mm -hmm. in the Pan-African struggle for freedom of expression and this I succeeded in doing. Mm -hmm. you see? What would you say is the state of journalism today? Maybe I, you can give us a... I think they are very fortunate that in these current times the government has become more tolerant, there has been more international recognition um, of the um, rights of journalists. The Gambia Press Union is now more organized than before and uh, Journalists can have training, which was very important at the time of my uh, at the time of my writing. They were not competent journalists. There were schoolboys who left school and came and joined the press. But now you have a school of journalism in the Gambia, from where people are graduating with some respectable uh, 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 qualifications. Now, uh, well, again, printing materials like are very costly, but the standard and the the state of the press now is far more is far more competitive because you have well published newspapers, well printed, with color photographs, unlike our times when we use cycle styling machines. You see? So I think there has been a very significant improvement, a very a very remarkable improvement in the state of the press as it was before. Unlike our times. What else would you say are uh, some of your other achievements as a journalist? Certainly you have done quite a bit. W have you had any relations with the trade unions? Well, yes. Amy Jaro was my mentor, yes. who was then the secretary of the IACFTU, International Confederation of Trade Unions. I had a lot to do with them because we were I had more in common with the trade unions, more so than the other organizations, the political, par the political parties. They were dynamic, they were progressive, they were, they were better organized in the sense that they fought for genuine causes of the improvement of the standard of living of uh, workers and the like. So I managed to get their cooperation by allowing them to publish their activities. This is how we came to the paper called The Toiler. I founded The Toiler, which far more far later continued to publish, but I was the first publisher of The Toiler. A toilet means somebody who works for his sweat. 
So, but then again, the union, the unions were not that so organized to be able to provide this required funds to meet the, to meet the cost of printing of these newspapers to the standard that we, we required. Well printed with the technology, of course, machines and the training. It was lacking. But nevertheless, I had their cooperation and their, and their support in the publishing of, of, of training and activities in the Gambia. When you think about your life as a journalist, as a Gambian, and somebody who has been quite active uh, before independence, during independence, or shortly after independence, to the current period before Yajama came to power, uh, can you assess for us? Are you, are you optimistic? Are you disappointed? Are you... No, on the contrary, I am very optimistic and not disappointed for the fact that when I decided to leave this country to go and study journalism, we had only the news bulletin. The yeah, news bulletin? Yes, which was government printed. I think June's was with his outlook, which had stories from abroad, you know, tales. Uh, Allen had not reached really any recognizable level which could give the paper the standard it required. So my going to Europe to study was for primarily to come and improve the standard of journalism in this country, which I succeeded in doing because I printed the first properly printed paper in Senegal. There after I came back and used the printing department to print me an other paper, but it was not compared to the, the one I printed in Senegal. I was fortunate also to print one in London with Dennis Lloyd, Charles introduced me to the gentleman. I printed some copies of the Gambian in London also. All these activities was aimed at improving the standard of the paper, acceptable to the commercial sector for advertisements, because the paper survive on advertisements. And without a properly printed paper, they will not pay the, 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 the amount you're asking for. So to make sure that I could capture the, a good part of the market to, to ensure my survival, I made sure that I proved, uh, I mean, I proved, um, I, I printed uh, I mean, papers of good quality, presentable enough to, 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 to earn the money, sort of money I was asking for. See? So I'm not disappointed at all. I think the, field, the members of the field have done a lot. There has been a lot of sacrifice. The night we were giving this award, I remember that 40, it was announced that 45 journalists were killed by Ayajami. Those 45 journalists were not professional. Yeah, I mean, they were not professional journalists. They were six formers, most of them who came and joined these papers and they were reported by NIA, arrested at night. Most of them were picked up in the streets. I'm 45 killed. journalists died within the 22 years of Jamal school government. Can you imagine? It was like a funeral, a funeral of the heroes that night in the hotel. Everybody was crying. What they did was they went through to the, all the Gambian prisons. If you don't find your, your, your relative or whoever you're looking for, you admit that he was dead. And we came to learn that the night we, we, we had this thing. So thank God, I am, I am one of those who really survived uh, intact, mm -hmm. which is very important. I maintain my health. I was arrested, I remember, I forgot to tell you, in 1983, I was in Baghdad, attending an international conference called by Saddam Hussein. I met a Senegalese, Mamles Dia, who was the editor of Le Politician in Senegal, mm -hmm. a leading paper in Senegal. After the speech I gave, he came and hugged me and said, oh, you are the very one I was looking for. Mm. <laughs> so we decided we'll travel to Senegal and I'll be writing the English edition of Le Politician. But then I said, let me go with one paper to sensitize the market. So I spent a week in Senegal and published a paper and came back. It was well received. Mm. Pair so convinced me that I can take him over and he'll help me with the job because what I did was well acclaimed by every Tom Dick and in this country. I said, yes, I went with Pearl. He was a drunkard. He drank so much the night and gave me so much problems that I decided to dismiss him. Mm. The next morning he went to Manchwada, Israel Wada. Manchwada. Manchwada. The Gambian ambassador in Dakar. Manchwada Wadi. Mwada. Manch. Mustafa. Mustafa Wada. Manch. He went and reported me that I was I have written an editorial which, if ever published, the Senegal Constitution will collapse. Jawara took his word, of course, he was his ambassador, arranged that the, the NIA arranged that I will be picked up at Amdalai. They promised that when I arrive, I should be arrested and sent direct to Banjul. Luckily enough, the call made by the ambassador to Jawara was intercepted by the Senegalese intelligence. Hmm. 
who informed my partner, Mamles, that if ever Ngan goes, he'll be arrested. Change your editorial. This was what saved me. Mm -hmm. So the guy came at midnight and found me sitting and said, Ngan, you know, man, he said, let's go to change your editorial because I've got uh, information from the intelligence set that Jawara has received information that all your arrivals you should be arrested. So he took me to one of the apartments that uh, uh, Jean Collier re rented for him. And uh, I stayed. Uh, 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 so I stayed from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock to write an other uh, editorial. I wrote an other editorial. We had to change the front page. Printed an other front page, attach it to the paper. And that's what I came on. Otherwise, I would have been caught. And that would have meant seven years in jail. In Gambia? Of course. Sedition. Exciting the public to revive against the government. Nobody can protect you from sedition. You go. So when they read it, the police read it and said, no, this is impossible. Like this, we are this what we are told. I said, what? They said, no. They said that you wrote something that was going to collapse the Gambia, this, that, and that. I said, we studied it. They said, no. I said, well, what do you want to say? Okay, they take off the hand off. And then they talk and swallow. you already coughed. Coughed, but they I was lucky. So when we came, <laughs> I was sent to my police station. I spent the night in the police station. They read the paper. The next morning, they took it to the president. The president said, release him. Far from me, I told him that he sh I should be taken to my two so that I'll be threatened never to come back with any material that they will become suspicious of. Far from me, he was like minister. Far from me, that's why he ended the way he's ended. Well, I wouldn't say women for the If they took me to my two, maximum security, where I found 11 people waiting for the death sentence. Tell if I had spent four nights in that place, I would be finished. I spent only one night. Dumoko Fate, Hatta Bojang at the time, published a paper alleging that the green bottles of oil that we are giving us gifts from the Saudi government was being sold by the PPP. And he also was in, in, in my crew. Hatta Bojang. Hatta Bojang. The whole night he spent reading the Quran, praying for me, and said that next morning you will be released. I swear he, he swear that I will be released. And the next morning, text came at nine o'clock, said that I should come back to the police station. They escorted me to the police station. He signed my release and said, "Mas <laughs> nyumuta nyumuk sunyu." They said, "Mas ikamas dara yombor." Mas was afraid to come to work because then he will <laughs> that he released me. So text released me. <laughs> and then I, came, I went home. That was the end of the story. That's how I came to relate with the Senegalese press union. I was very popular in Senegal with mm -hmm. Mamles. Abdul Juf came to know. Abdul Juf used to give me money, one million, now and then. Mm -hmm. Samuel, now and then. And then I wrote articles which I again translated in, into, in, 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 into French for the Senegalese reading public. See? And I became so popular because Les was a radical investigative journalist who really shook the government, you know? So I worked with him, so I became, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that was an other episode. <laughs> so that was the way that I got into Senegal. Mm -hmm. So when I went back after Jame, I got an easy way into the press union, and it's hard by sympathy. They already know you. Yeah, they already know you. They, I had their sympathy. They were paying me for what I knew what I didn't deserve, quite frankly, but to sustain my family here. Because they all knew that, well, given the opportunities they had, I was far better than them. I could do better than them. They know you. You know me. Well, Mr. Thomas, certainly you've had a very distinguished career in both countries, Senegal and Gambia. If you were to advise the current government, or maybe I should say, can you give us an assessment of the current government, the state of government, and what would you advise them to do? Being that they are what they call JJC, Johnny Joscom, they are new in the game. Yes. I would say that there was a lot of room for improvement in their performances, considering the initial stage, how they have maneuvered, and how they have come to offer solutions to the problems that long stood in the history of Gambia's uh, uh, records. However, I think a diversion from the usual trend of focusing on tourism and all these other sectors without giving agriculture its due. Mm. Uh, we will always make our efforts futile. At the end of the day, we will never make it without taking agriculture the most, more seriously, give, giving it the impetus it needs, the, 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 the input it needs to allow governments to become independent and self-sufficient. 
in their daily food, rice, groundnut, millet, goose. There is no substitute for food. And when food fails, civilization falls apart. Mm -hmm. Gambians are only making efforts that will bring temporary solutions. But to get a final end to our problems is to concentrate on agriculture and give it the priority it deserves. Education, health and all these other obviously are important. But without agriculture giving us the generated income to meet the cost of these other social services, we will be nowhere. We have learned from history that all those countries that fail, everything started from failure of their agricultural projects. In the end, tourism is a volatile industry. Mm -hmm. Depending on it, it's, 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 it's risky. And the current trend is a proof of what I'm saying. Coronavirus has come. And all the factors in the past that has con contributed to its current uh, unfortunate situation. So I think the government at this stage to focus on agriculture and to improve obviously the standard of living of Gambians should be their number one priority. Unless and until this country is able to feed itself and be able to export even the excess that we can make without exaggeration, we will never prosper. Any government that comes, I, I start, I'm, I'm prepared to stand by my point of view. Agriculture is our major concern. We must be able to feed ourselves. And we can do that. Other countries have proved that China is here today. It was the most downtrodden country. Today, China is proud. To all this South Korea and all this Japan and all these countries, they are good examples. Our people can go and learn from the lessons of those people, borrow or beg their competence in, in technology import it into Gambia and do as they did to us to gain what they gain. This is not impossible. Why are you still waiting on conflicts, wasting time on feasibility studies that would never end anywhere? Just intellectual exercises without any meaningful practical uh, what they call it, application. We need to go back to the land. And if we fail to go to the land, given the next few years, things will continue to be worse than ever. We are not seeing anything yet. The day we stand here and know that rice is no more, goose is no more, there is drought. You must take the climate into consideration. That the opportunities we have now enjoying the full year of rain and the light can one day stop. Hmm? You remember the seven days of plenty and seven days of uh, poverty in, in, in Yusuf's story. Mm -hmm. So Gambia should learn from these lessons. We are a small country, one and a half million. We should be able to feed ourselves. I think it's a disgrace not to import rice into this country with all the land, arable land that we have. It's a disgrace. I don't consider them progressive at all. Knowing that the past governments have failed in these adventures, why not improve on, their, on, the, on, the, on the conditions that prevail to, to make a difference? Why? So this is my view. Unless and until we take the priority, our priority, we learn to know our priorities. We will never make it. Conferences and all these things are all meaningless. The tourism, which is second, the most, most important sector in the, in, the, in the economy, is now zero. So what do we depend on? We cannot borrow, continue borrowing. We are not able to pay. We are, debt. we are not able to pay the debts that we already owe. The government knows it. I'm not hiding it. They won't take me for anything. They are, they are, so they are debted to their throat. They cannot pay it. Of course, nobody will take a nation to court. But then, <laughs> your facility, uh, the facilities, to, 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 the chances to get increase in the, in the debts will be limited. They will not continue feeding with debts. No, sir. It's time they learn that agriculture is our only solution. And the priorities we have are mixed. We must have to regulate them and know where our interest lies. Well, Mr. Thomas, clearly you haven't lost your fire. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still very critical. But on that note, we want to thank you for taking the time. Thank you, but I'm duly critical. Yes. Because I think um, uh, the government deserves to be, to, be, to be encouraged. Yes. And by telling them what is lacking, I think it's one of the best means, ways and means of making them wake up. It's no longer a government of conferences. It's a government of plantations, government of harvest and seedings, sowing. Without which we can't go. As I said, food fails, civilization falls apart, that's why the country is what it is today. Mm -hmm. Everybody is crying. 
Whether they know it or they don't know it, it's a lie. They know it. The income per capita in Nakatra, the, the, the income per capita is like zero next to nothing. The standard of living is so down poor. It's very poor. Governments are very poor. They want the poorest country in the world. And we shouldn't be because one hundred one point eight million with this amount of land. All we need to do is feed ourselves, clothe ourselves. Invite outside participation. They must have the confidence that we are self-reliant mm -hmm. before they will come. Nobody will give you money knowing that you cannot pay it. Absolutely. Oh yeah, well. One, two, make four. Well, you've provided us with a very important blueprint huh? uh, for the country. And I hope the powers that be uh, listen to you in the process. So thank you so much, Mr. Thomas. You're welcome. For taking the time. Thank you for having me. Yeah.